just joining us. We're following the breaking news out of Haiti. The largest, most powerful earthquake in the region's history has crippled the country, measuring 7.0. Its epicenter was just a few miles outside the capital, Port-au-Prince. We have reports that uh, there were fatalities. Um, we don't have uh, an exact number as yet. Haiti's prime minister telling CNN that he believes the quake has taken hundreds of thousands of lives, destroying or damaging all of Port-au-Prince. Sumiu um monte de gente que estava aqui embaixo. No momento. Meu Deus do céu. We are facing um, a disaster of uh, as yet unknown magnitude. Are they, are they alive? Three alive. Three alive. We need more people down here. Everything was just falling apart, you know, all over the place. You know, people was crying and, you know, the roof, like the ceiling was falling. And, and they just walked into the bedroom and I went to take a shower. This was happened to me in the shower. I see the house keep checking. Boom, 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 boom. I tried to get out and everything else tried to fall down. Piers have collapsed into the water. Cranes have toppled over. Shipping containers are in the water. Buildings at the wharfs have collapsed. As I looked at my window, uh, I, I saw then this buildings, all the buildings, all the homes, just pancaking down, one on top of the other, on top of the other. The reports and images that we've seen of collapsed hospitals, crumbled homes, and men and women carrying their injured neighbors through the streets are truly heart-wrenching. There's not a sense of, of you know, of what's happening next. People are literally just trying to get through today. Um, I don't even know that people can, can think about what, what happens tomorrow. The commander of U.S. Southern Command says the U.S. military is working feverishly to provide relief to the victims of the Haiti earthquake. Secretary of Defense has put the entire focus of the United States Department of Defense on providing relief uh, to Haiti. And so the resources of the Department of Defense are available to do that and we're making use of every asset that we have. We are clearly in a position um, to do more than others, uh, partly from our proximity and partly from our capabilities. Tomorrow morning, the United States uh, carrier, the Carl Vinson, will arrive on station. And we're anticipating what they'll need. We're establishing a logistics hub at Guantanamo Bay. We're establishing the sea base off of Port-au-Prince. We will flow supplies from the uh, Gitmo to the sea base and then ashore and get that rolling and we'll do that pretty well. We will have the uh, three ships of an amphibious ready group headed by the USS Bataan with roughly 2200 Marines, heavy equipment and the ability to move that heavy equipment from ship to shore uh, to start providing capacity and capability there. Again right now we're planning uh, very expeditiously to quickly load these ships because our, our focus is to get to Haiti and uh, provide the relief uh, necessary as quickly as possible. This really is what we train for. We do this, you know, this, this is our job. Uh, we're, we're well trained, well prepared for it. Um, and we're all re ready to go, you know, ready to get out of here and do what we're trained to do. While these assets tend to the immediate material and medical needs of the people of Haiti, these ships, aircraft, and troops also deliver hope. Although it seems that supplies and security cannot come quickly enough. The, the key is to get the food and the water in there as quickly as possible uh, so that people uh, don't, in their desperation, uh, turn to violence. Distribution and logistics 
is the key to providing relief. So the airport uh, does have only a single runway. It has limited ramp space, and so we're really metering a lot of the flights that are coming in. Aircraft are the ones that provide the immediate response capability. Just that drop alone provided around 14,000 meals and about 4,000 gallons of water to relieve uh, some of the uh, suffering there for the uh, Haitian people. We're just trying to figure this out as we go uh, with uh, the guidance we get. Uh, guidance is continually changing because you know all of the processes around here are still uh, getting fine-tuned. Essentially that port has been uh, disabled, almost destroyed with respect to the ability to service large cargo ships that are essential to providing a robust relief effort down there. Geography is our biggest challenge right now. It hasn't really rained in a while and the ground is still pretty soupy. Uh, there's just places on this coastline that wheeled vehicles can't get to. Uh, and I know there's, there's elderly who have been affected by this uh, who can't necessarily get from uh, a position in the higher ground or further out in the hinterland. But, uh, that's why we're here. We're going to push out a little bit further. All of us at Southern Command working around the clock to provide relief to Haiti. I am pleased to report today that the 22nd Marine Expeditionary Unit from Camp Lejeune, North Carolina is arriving off the coast of Haiti. The Navy Marine Corps team on the USS Baton Amphibious Readiness Group is beginning operations. They'll bring water, food, and medicine to those in need. The amphibious ships are loaded with helicopters, amphibious vehicles, trucks, generators, and water purification units. The Marines and Sailors will be supporting the interagency relief efforts led by USAID. And at this center where we will uh, increasingly be able to coordinate and synchronize all of our activities to ensure that we are able to put humanitarian assistance uh, where it needs to be as quickly as possible. There's still, um, still portions of the search and rescue teams out there still trying to find uh, individuals that are buried in the rubble. I'm sad for the reason we're here, but I'm happy that we're helping. The Navy's motto is that we're a global force for good. This is the epitome of that. There's supposed to be a lot of help coming here, so. I hope so, man. I hope so, like, it's like right now, it's really, it's really no, it, it, was, it was already no Haiti, so now it's really no Haiti. I'm so happy because they are coming to help the people we need. And so there was a lot of we don't know what's going on or how this is all going to work. We just know it's going to work. So it was very much a sense of we need to get there now. You know, they woke up one morning and you know their life was completely devastated. And they were getting to the point that a lot of patients were beyond saving. Walking onto the pier, they had buses pulling in and people getting off. I mean, literally some people just coming from work. I and mean, they most of the crew had 24 hours notice, some less, some more. I sort of compared it to, it felt very much like when army unit goes on deployment. There's a sense of excitement, you know, hey, guys, people getting back together, we're going, uh, we're going overseas, but, and it's kind of an adventure, but also this is serious. This is very, this is life and death for a lot of people. I'd say the majority of the crew, this was the very first time aboard the Comfort. So a lot of them had you know, no idea what the plan were, what the expe expectations were. We got to get down there, get down there fast, and start working because this is not this is not a pleasure cruise. This is not even a normal naval deployment. We're on to a, going on a specific mission to help a specific crisis. The ship had limited supplies. As much as they loaded everything up as quickly as possible, and the initial estimates were they had enough supplies on board to, that the Comfort could handle patients for 30 days, 24 hours, 24-hour operations. The first meeting on Saturday night, they had. Just ask questions like who needs their assignments, who needs who, who needs to know where they're going to work, and most of the room just put their hand up in the air saying we don't know what's going on or where we're supposed to be. Medical, these were medical experts. You know, these are people who knew their job and had trained for this. 
you know, their entire career. This is what they were uh, trained to do. This is why they joined. This is what they joined. This is what they wanted to do. Uh, while most of the people were from Bethesda and other medical, naval medical stations across the country, that was a level of, of determination. Um, everyone knew that this was going to be bad. This was going to be rough. There was going to be a lot of people who needed help very badly. Everyone had to learn where their place was in that big, the big uh, process of patient care. A lot of the crew were just coming in for the first time, so there was a lot of training uh, that had to go on. The Comfort is designed to be you know, very, not just a big hospital ship, but to be able to care for and treat people very, very quickly. And so it's, it doesn't function like a normal hospital in many ways. And so a lot of people had to be brought up on, okay, this is how it works. And, Meantime, the hospital ship USNS Comfort has finally arrived off the coast of Haiti and is now seeing her first patients. The night the first patients came aboard was, was very, I don't want to say, it was very interesting. <laughs> um, people did not, they, the crew did not expect them that, that night. There's a, just a knowledge among the crew that you know Wednesday is going to be the big day. Wednesday we're going to get our first patients, and so today's the last day. So let's. They had an ice cream social set up and just a nice one more relaxing, one more fun moment before they kick in the high gear. And then the call came over the announcement that the patient's actually not coming Wednesday. It's coming Tuesday night, and they're not coming in a couple hours. They're coming like right now. The first patients that came in, one was a six-year-old boy who had a broken uh, pelvis, and the other one was a 20-year-old who had a, had a fractured skull, and hemorrhage, I believe, and a skull that would needed uh, treatment very, it was very severe. Critical cases, they were cases that needed treatment very immediately. The, the ship never, the ship never stopped being busy, even even late into the night. The patients didn't start arriving until after six o'clock. That's when flight operations started up. And they, the first flights start coming in about 6.30 and they start taking patients aboard and they ceased flight operations at sundown. And it was a long day for a lot of people and the last patients will come in at night. And then for the first couple of nights, I know they didn't get done treating those patients until four o'clock that morning and then it starts all over again at six. The first couple days there was a very that since in the beginning of a race where everyone just kind of runs really fast and tries to get out get out in front very quickly and uh, one thing that the leadership cautioned on is like understand this is not a sprint this is a marathon there will be a, this will be a long a lot of long days back to back with no breaks and they don't get Saturday and Sunday off. A lot of people came on board who you know, not only were suffering injuries, but had had experienced some you know, horrible, horrific emotional losses. You know, kids who come on board who their parents are gone. Talk about um, a kid who was crying, crying for his mother, and how do you tell him that your mother's not coming home? That your mother's not going to come here because. She, she didn't make it out. You know, the Comfort was designed to treat combat wounded. And combat wounded is one thing emotionally where, you know, no one in our service is there because they didn't want to. Everyone volunteers, everyone knows the risks, and if this happens, it happens. And, but these people in Haiti, of course, didn't ask for this. You know, they woke up one morning and, you know, every, their life was completely devastated. I mean, they had very, very little intel, very little, I mean, it's not like a, you know, nobody gathers intel on, uh, on Haiti, uh, especially, you know, prior to a natural disaster. So it's not like going into a combat zone where they already have, you know, intel and, and, and briefs and, and, and plans and, uh, you know, things in place. 
Other than knowing that there was an earthquake and, and a lot of people needed help, they really landed blind. Initially, the first day, it was, it was very chaotic, but even the troops didn't know really what they were, how they were going to do it. In fact, the, the first day, they thought, okay, we'll just take it down into the camp and give it to them. Uh, we, we made it a foot outside the perimeter and were just swamped. They weren't angry, but any crowd, even a happy crowd, is a dangerous crowd. They enlisted local Haitians to act to help with security. Uh, to help with the organization because they didn't want it to be, uh, appear that that the, the U.S. soldiers were were uh, controlling it. They wanted to be very careful to not be heavy-handed, not uh, set up that security in a heavily military manner. Uh, there were no weapons on the perimeter. Uh, the troops walked around, and the second day, the troops got rid of even their personal weapons. Uh, because they did not want to present uh, that, that image. They didn't want to add to any tension. It was already a, a chaotic, intense uh, situation. I think most of them who had done uh, multiple tours in Iraq or in Afghanistan were, were used to a lot of the, the, uh, the aspects. Even, even the lack of mobility uh, is, there was similar to the lack of mobility and lack of infrastructure in Afghanistan. So they were, they were used to having to figure out, hey, how can I get through this damaged city? They were very moved by the conditions that the people were having to live in, uh, in the streets, bathing in the streets, trash in the streets, uh, living in the open air, uh, setting up homes in the markets. Most of these soldiers are, are, are family uh, members, mothers, uh, fathers, uh, even the ones who are single, you know, they've all, they all have brothers and sisters. And, and it was very difficult for them emotionally uh, because, you know, how do you tell a 90-year-old a, a, a grandmother that she can't take her, her baby through the line and, and get water? One of the few female soldiers uh, was a mother, uh, and I talked to her, and, and, and she flat out told me that, that she didn't want to be on the, on the line anymore. Uh, she didn't like seeing the... Uh, kids. Uh, she let a young mother and a, and a kid go through the line, skip, you know, skip ahead. Um, and she, she flat out told me, she says, I know I wasn't supposed to, but I couldn't help it. Um, it's, it, was, it was a lot of emotional uh, uh, give and take uh, uh, with, with, that, with that part of the mission. It's very difficult to go to a hospital and not, 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 uh, not be very impacted by what you saw. Uh, the hallways were, were, were stacked with people. Uh, the, the couple that I went to, people were literally living outside of the hospitals. We're, we're talking a couple hundred people uh, sitting in hospital beds parked in the parking lot uh, or living under a tarp in the parking lot. You have a small child sitting on a hospital bed, has, have their, their IV running, just like they were admitted into the hospital, except they're, they're sleeping in the parking lot. Most of them have felt very bad uh, for the local uh, Haitians. Uh, there was a lot of sympathy for their, their situation. Uh, they felt like they were, they, were, they were doing a good job in, in, in uh, providing that aid. Um, and, they, and they were happy to serve. The first impression when you're flying over is like, well, it's not really, it doesn't look that bad. And they were almost like zombies walking down the street in absolute shock. How could a person who lived this long, who survived the earthquake, got treated and survived for a week and a half to die 50 feet from the help that they needed? And we're dialing it up where it's necessary based upon the needs uh, on the ground. Does the wait in line get longer every day? Every day, more and more. Do you have any idea how many meals you've handed out here? On a daily average, um, eight to 12,000 meals a day. Uh, this specific area of operations, we go out, we patrol it every day. We locate um, the best places to distribute uh, you know, whatever we have, be it the humanitarian, humanitarian daily rations, or the water, or the rice. Um, and we just want to build good rapport with the people so that we can uh, get them the aid that they need at this time. 
What you see going on here today is a bulk issue of class one uh, intended to last for about two weeks time for a family of five. This actually allows the families to get beyond the day to day. You know, when they get enough food for a couple of weeks, they can start to go beyond worrying about where's their next meal. The driving force was the thought of if I had a family member or a loved one or God forbid a child that was there and I was thousands of miles away, I would want someone there to do everything they could. The troops are working in, in really, really austere conditions um, all over the country. And, uh, and I'll tell you that not a one of them complains about it. It's amazing. Uh, they are at food distribution points, medical distribution points, uh, hastily put up uh, tents all over the country that serve as uh, medical environments, uh, much better than, than what the Haitian people might get somewhere else. And these doctors, nurses, medics, soldiers are providing the kind of life-saving uh, life steps that, that really make a huge difference. I, I have not seen a crew force more eager to go and respond than I did Friday night and Saturday. Th these young men and women, uh, some of them deploying soon, some of them just back from deployment, uh, they were here, not only the ones going out, but the ones that weren't going out asking to go out. The injuries they treated were orthopedic, broken bones, so crushed by buildings and, and other various things and and uh, they start seeing people with not just wrappings around the leg but then they had no leg and then they had no arm or a comp one or two limbs gone. The screaming, I mean there were people very obviously very uncomfortable, particularly they're trying to move them or you know people just just crying out in pain. And, but when the comfort arrived they knew they were not going to be the people going down there and take over. They had no intention of, we are now the facility and we're the bosses. But what the comfort put together was a few uh, rapid assessment teams, which is usually uh, a, doc a few doctors and support personnel who would uh, go out this, to these sites. One, they sent uh, one of these teams to um, set up a triage facility at Terminal Thoreau, where, which was initially going to be the, the place where they would embark up patients to the uh, comfort on, on a boat. When I got there Saturday, actually, and they were moving patients pretty regular, regularly. There's a helicopter there, you know, every couple minutes to get, get the patients out. And then it was kind of a dry spell for about two hours. Yeah, the choppers just stopped coming. I do not know why. We saw it; they were flying overhead. I mean, it's not like they just stopped. You know, we see there goes the chopper. Oh, it's not stopping. Oh, there goes another one. Now, oh, where's it going? Okay. All right. When's the next one coming? Some of the patients were very serious. There was one lady who was pregnant and about to give birth. Um, and several other cases that were, were sepsis and infections were getting pretty far. At, th at that point, a week and a half out, that was one of the big problems they had was with, no longer with the uh, orthopedic injuries, but now the infections that had set in. And they were getting to the point that a lot of patients were beyond saving. They had to decide, like, basically they had to start pulling the plug earlier and decide that we can't save this person. They're, they sort of broke down people into three categories. One, people who are injured and they're gonna recover no matter what we do. Then there's people injured and they're not gonna recover no matter what we do. And then there's people that we can help. Every time a helicopter showed up, whether, who knew why it was there, they had patients on litters ready to go out and get on the helicopter. The, the team there, is a, a Captain Sharp, was went out and started talking with people in the helicopter, saying we need to get these people out. Waiting there, one of these patients has died right there, 50 feet from the helicopter. And and um, you know they tried to move as the day went on. They're trying to get people out, but some people are like, someone pulled me aside and said, you know, if they're if they're sending people to the ship. You know, they're going to get treated. If they're sending them back to like another hospital in Haiti, they're basically sending them there to die. And it takes a special person to be able to walk in that situation and not just crumble under the weight of what you see. People do this job, you have to have a you know, really soft heart but really thick skin. You know, sit there and see this because I know it was tearing me up.
know, these people deserve our help. And what they deserve more than anything is the dignity and the respect that the people of this sovereign nation should have. And I, I hope that our lasting legacy here is the legacy of a people that came to help when help is needed. As much as we're trained to be war fighters, I mean, most people are, want to make a difference.